What's up, guys? Welcome back. Episode four of the Fresh One podcast by BD Outdoors. Uh, we are here today with the leader of Bloody Dax and Local Knowledge, Ali Husseini, and our special guest, Ben Seacrest from Accurate. Behind the scenes, we got Ira and Ricky running the tables for us. How you guys doing? Good, man. Good, good. Well, yeah, man. I know um, Ali and Ben, you guys have been friends for a really long time. You have a lot of roots in this industry, and I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear your guys' perspective on the changes in this industry over the last 30 years. Um, so, yeah, let's dive into it. Ben, how you doing? Good. Everything's good. I just got back from Mexico. I fished that uh, East Cape uh, tuna tournament. Absolutely helmet. Um, <laughs> 91 degree water and just... Uh, it's tough, Ali. You see, you know what, Ali? The, the what really that slaps me in the face in the sense where everybody's going, you know, there's climate change. I'm like, dude, there's a little climate change. When I see 91 degree water, I can't remember seeing 91 degree water. We got it in PV a few times back in the day, and you talk huh. about flipping a light switch. 88 degrees is like the number. They huh. those yellowfin will bite right in up to about 88 degrees, and then pff, nose in the mud. Huh? They well, I mean, it's you know what? I'll tell you if you pay attention. You'll learn every single day, and I learned a lot when I. The first thing I was sitting there, I go, "What's the water temperature?" And he goes, "It's 91." I'm like, "91 degrees." I mean, I have never caught fish in 91 degree water, <laughs> and, you're so. pro- and you probably won't. Yeah, yeah okay. You know, Rutchie least... saw 92 this year. Wow. In in the Keys, 92 degree water. I'm like, "How's fishing?" It yeah. sucks. Well, you heard about what's going on there. That's killing. It's killing the environment. It's it's ruining their reefs. It's yeah. doing all sorts of stuff. So. I heard right now they're taking and grabbing reef and bringing it into some of those facilities in Miami and growing reef. Yeah. And they're trying to make it so that the reef can actually live in higher. I think it's water. called the Moat Lab. And it's yeah, down it there. It's right by Mikey's house in Cutco, <clears throat> I think. Or maybe it's on Summerlin. But they have yeah. a whole deal there where, yeah, they're building reef. They're basically propagating and growing reef. And then they're replacing it and seeing what yeah. they learn along the way. That's awesome. Really a cool deal. They're doing the same yeah. thing out here, though. A lot of these companies are doing the same thing with kelp restoration. Correct. They're doing it in Australia. They're doing it out here. We're seeing a similar thing. I know we're not at 92 degree water, but we're seeing these companies come in and try to figure out what happened to the kelp in Southern California. Same thing as the seagrass out there, which is so trippy. I mean, we you talk, Ali, a bunch about the 10-year cycle and all this and that. And I believe in that, totally. Yeah, I, I believe in cycles. I mean, I think you have to be crazy to say we're not having an impact on climate, mm-hmm. but... Al Gore told us all the icebergs were going to be gone 25 years ago. And yeah. there's the exact same number of yeah. icebergs. Like if you think that all of our, you know, aerosol cans and hairspray is completely going to change a world this big, that's been around for that long, that fast stuff happens in eons. It doesn't happen in years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, Oh, what about the, the uh, hole huh. in the ozone? Well, that's gone. We fixed that. Like, I don't know. I, I definitely believe we're having an impact and not a good impact on our environment, but yeah. I don't think, I think it gets very, very much exaggerated because People just don't have answers for stuff. Look at the El Nino that we had in 2015. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Never before recorded. Yeah. Right? I mean, but you can't that was an ins- El Nino. That was insane. That was insane. Yeah. Totally insane. So I, you and I could talk about fishing, and we do. Oh, well, uh, forever. Yeah. Yeah, and it's too early to have a beer, so we're going to probably <laughs> use less cuss words than we normally would. Yeah. But w- there's a few things that you've done that I have no window into, and, and mostly because you're old as hell. Jeez, thanks. But, uh... <laughs> One of the things that I know you did a lot of when you were younger, and dude, before I even knew you, I remember seeing you in Western Outdoor News and, oh, and on Let's Talk Hookup back in 1863. Yeah. And uh, you were known for two things. Well, probably some other stuff we can't talk about here, but stop, the, the stop, big two, please. the big two, you were the Calico Bass guy. Yep. Why well, I used to watch the videos, all that stuff, which I don't care about that, so let's not talk about that. Okay. Uh, and the other one was long range. Yeah. You were you were a long range junkie. And you were doing it when that whole game changed, right? I mean, you when- know what? I have a story on that that people like. I talk to people now, and then they're like, "Huh?" Like when I did long range, I want to say it was in the first long range trip I ever took was in '86 or '87. Holy moly! And I actually fished on a boat with the deck hands being Rollo Hine, Timmy, Brian Kiyohara. Um two other guys every guy ross ross and then there was one other guy every guy that i fished with owned a boat after that they're all boat owners and they had to be kids back then they were like brian brian kiyohara you know brian kiyohara i do casually how 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 big is he six two yeah when i knew him he was like five seven oh my god so on that trip this is a crazy deal on that trip 
I met my wife. So my wife was with one of her friends, which I thought they were hooked up and they weren't. And I would like, he, he knows me. I'm full speed all the time. I'm, if there's fish, I'm going to catch him, right? So I'd stay up all night and I'd sleep a couple hours and stay up all night. Well, I got her into that whole thing and she caught one of everything. We had a couple jackpot fish, did this whole thing. But the whole thing back then that was really cool was you were fishing with the tackle we have today is so far above the stuff that we fished. And back then, 80 pound mono was bastard. You either fish 60 or 100. That's crazy. Right? And there was no like 130 or whatever. What? And, and nowadays, when I look at things, everything that we used to fish now is super small, right? I mean, think of how many 200 pound fish you caught on fairly small tackle. It was impossible. Right. And back, back then. then, but again, I want to make another thing and I'm not, and I'll ask him, but my opinion is yellowfins fight way harder than the bluefins do. Dude. I mean, they get not, after it. That's not an opinion. It's a fact. Okay, good. A and good. if anybody argues it with you, show them the tail of a 200-pound bluefin. That's a, show that, them the tail see, of a 200-pound so yellowfin. So you talk to him and you talk to me. It's the same guy. But it's it's comes like, down to, it, dude, who has got a bigger propeller? And, it's and, not even close. And they have this stud length in that goes from the caudal uncle up to where you're talking the main body starts. A bluefin's real squat yep right and those yellow fins are, are spread out but back in the day what i what i had most respect for is if you caught a big fish like kurt weisenheimer's 388 when it was caught right he couldn't get into another boat and take off the boat was on anchor he caught the fish couldn't touch the rail couldn't do any, no one could touch the line until they killed the fish that is something that's amazing. Nowadays, it's like, hey, I got it, and I've, I've got it in the rod holder, and I'm winding as hard as I can, and here it is. It's a color, and let's kill it, you know. And it's like, back then, those guys were two studs. My the, my first two hundred pound fish was on the quad for uh, one hundred five, and I thought it was I was young. I was like twenty eight years old, twenty nine years old. I thought I was gonna die, <laughs> right? And it, I remember it was a, it was at Clarion at the thirty five spot. And it was just one of those insane things. But long range fishing back then was to me, it was like there was true pioneers. Like I got to fish with the pioneers. I got, I fished with Milt Shedd and I fished with Greg Stotesbury's dad used to go all the time and Greg would go and we all went long range fishing. And the only thing we were all after that thing that we couldn't have, you know, and that was like a 250, a 300, whatever it be. But um, the one thing I always remember is just learning. You're learning from like, you know, in those days, it's, it's Frank Lepresti. It's, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, the, the other skipper that was on that boat, but you know, you had a group of skippers that were there that were the long range guys. Imagine going down into the banks and having no knowledge of those banks. Oh dude. But I got to like, for me, I'd prefer it that way. Yeah. I like finding stuff. Yeah, that well, that's me. Yeah, those guys Oof. were all about it. But yeah. the thing that always think of those days of the pioneering and yeah. not knowing what was over that next horizon, that next yeah. rock, dude, that gets me fired up. I've, yeah. Dude, you've caught it all. I've yeah. caught it all. Like I've caught yeah. it more fish than I ever would have imagined. Yeah, finding a badass new cod spot, I lose my mind. Yeah. I'm so stoked. He that's knew funny. that. He, I so told stoked. him a while ago. I found. I didn't really find him. I had someone else like show me one. And I beat it to death for like five years. And then all of a sudden I realized that people had been following me up the spot. Yeah. And once they, once other people got word of it, it was done. But there's still a million things around like that to catch. I mean, you know, you can find those spots, but what he's saying is you gotta scratch your head and you gotta go, Okay, I'm not gonna go to the same old place. It's the same thing if someone goes, Hey, we're going to the two oh nine. Do I run a straight line to the two oh nine? No. I go jog a half mile, a mile half a mile mile and people are like why are you doing that new water yeah everybody goes straight new water keep on moving out figure out your new water and then once in a while you go oh look at that foamer and you're like wow okay you would have never found it unless you scratched your head and went and looked for it no totally and that to me that that's the adventure part <laughs> is everything and i know rush and i talk about this all the time like that's why we like doing the show is the adventure oh we yeah get to go do different stuff different places and honestly the people like I've got yeah. to fish with some of the best captains in the world. Yeah. So have you, yeah. like if you pick off two nuggets from every one of them, you're light years ahead. Yeah. It's you all know? about keeping you with the thing I look at now is like, people always go, he's unfriendly. He doesn't say much. No, I'm not unfriendly. I'm the friendliest guy, you know, 
keep my ears open, my mouth shut, I learn one thing a day, right? Maybe yeah. two things. If you're lucky. Yeah, and long range fishing, I talked too much. I didn't learn a lot and I had to figure it out later on. Yeah, you're you're definitely a guy who grills. Like, you get on my boat, haven't been on my boat this year. Yeah. You dive right into my shit. You're asking me why I'm doing this, yeah. why I'm doing that, and not, and I'm the same way. I yeah. ask questions. And fortunately for me, for some, from some of those older guys I got to fish with, once you start asking questions, paying attention, yeah. taking notes, Dude, they'll tell you everything. Yeah, and but you know that the hardest thing that people don't understand is they think it's like, oh, it's this and that. There's wind, there's current, there's water temp, there's breaks, there's all these things. And that's why I say with long range fishing, there was no thing overhead telling them, hey, there's a temp break here, or there's a whatever. Yeah. It was the guy that was coming back up the hill. There was no fly homes. Yep. The guy's coming up back the hill. Hey, I found a temp break right off the hurricane bank or whatever it is. I went on a trip one time on the 105 down to the hurricane. Oh, I wasn't supposed to go to the hurricane. So in the days, the Revilla Hejedos were like Clarion's Caro, Benedicto, Rocco Partita, right? And then you'd stock at, at the rocks, Aleos rocks on the way down. Well, we did the whole thing and we caught zero. So he goes, we're going out to the bank. So we went out to Hurricane Bank. We caught 511 Wahoo oh. in two or three days on the bank trolling bait whatever and back then it's funny when you talk to people now they're like well what about wire well there was no wire yeah it was straight mono and what size mono are you using 60 and what did you do well what you do is back then we had a bucket full of jigs and we had all these jigs in the bucket you'd go down with 50 jigs and come home with maybe 15 because <laughs> that was how it was and there's things that people don't understand like wahoo fishing and you know this you never stop winding, never stop winding, because when a wahoo comes up and hits a jig, if he's going to hit a bait at all, hits it sideways, it his mouth. because what he's trying to do is cut it in half and spin around and eat the other half, right? So when they eat it, they'll hold on to it as long as it's moving, and as, as it continues to move, and you get right to the back of the boat, I don't know how many times I can tell you this, and I'm cranking away, cranking away, cranking away, and the guy puts a gaff in the fish, the jig falls right out of its mouth. Yeah. It still happens that way. Like I, I, with that, you were talking 2015, I remember hooking Wahoo. And I go, don't stop whining, don't stop whining. I could see the Wahoo come in, don't stop whining. And as soon as the winder sees the fish, they stop and the fish just swims away. Yeah, totally. Like, what are you doing? And they're going, you don't realize, but most of the time when you hook these fish, you're hooking them in the outside of the mouth, but they're holding so tight to the bait that you're not getting penetration. If you stop whining and they open their mouth, the jig just falls right out of their face. And it's funny because I still, when I'm in mag, which is really my only chance to, you know, fish myself for Wahoo. Yeah, yeah. Mono. Yeah. On my, on my. I clubs, won't use wire. I don't use. I use two a, a short shot, a 200 pound mono. Yeah. Tied to a diving plug, and I don't like. I learned a bunch of this down in in Venice when we were down there doing all that stuff. Yeah, you yeah. Know what, 15 years ago, catching a lot of them, you get more bites. Dude, you are not going to get bit off on a Rapala oh, no. once no. every once every 30 fish will get bit off yeah. which is a fine trade in my mind the mono just gets bit better yeah I, I don't know what it is but like that that is uh that's like our little secret I, yeah. and i'm happy to tell people about yeah. it but i fish straight the big rapala plugs <clears throat> we put we put the um single hooks on them yeah and that's all you need you don't need marauders you don't no. need a jet head i mean they just work the slimmer hooks it's the thing that people don't get is if you fish a bait and it has a hard outside and then it has sort of a, a sort of a soft inside the fish can go through and they go through the outside of that and it holds they can hold the bait the bait he's talking to you can't get through the hardness of the bait it just uh, zips them right into it, their what fingers. it does is it slides right through and right slides right into the out it's, it goes to the outside of their face a lot of the times if you hook them in the mouth that means they come straight up behind it but it's like trying to go through and tell people that and you're looking at them. And one other thing that I figured out too that was interesting is I don't fish bait, but when I do, I'll fish 130 fluorocarbon and then just figure out whatever whatever size hook I need from there. And people are tripping and they're going, what are you doing? And I'm like, just trace leader of that fluorocarbon, throw the bait out, you get bit, let them run off, hook them, and then don't stop whining, yeah. you know? But it's been a while since... Uh, the last time I think I caught Wahoo, believe it or not, was in uh, Puerto Vallarta. Oh wow! No, no, no! I caught no, I caught Wahoo in Fiji last year. I caught Wahoo in Fiji. Oh, you were there for the Wahoo's? Was it yeah. good or was it? Uh, no, just, just it was gone. just it yeah. was just okay. Dude, we were getting them on plugs when I did that Nomad trip on the Coral Sea on stick baits catching yeah. Wahoo. Oh my gosh, that's as good as it gets. Wahoo's yeah. one of those fish I have no sympathy for yeah, at yeah. all. Like you tormented me so many times, you've bit me off so many times. Oh, yeah. I've trolled for days and not got yeah. one. 
when they're going to go dumb, I'm going to go dumb. Like, yeah. I will pile Wahoo on the back back of our – we were in MAG a couple years ago. I had one morning I did 23. The next morning I did, like, 16. Yeah. Killed them all. I got no yeah. – sorry. You're, you're too delicious. Yeah, they just stack them. You, you freeze know, really like good. Yeah, yeah, it's not your fault. We don't yeah. get that often. We don't get to chase you that often. But sorry, buddy. You're going in the bag. and it, Dude, that's some of the most exciting fishing that there is. Especially, like, uh, we were in Australia fishing the backside of Australia from Perth coming up to um, – we were going up to Darwin, and as we were going up, the guys that we were with go, hey, we got a pinnacle. We're going to go fish this pinnacle. And I was like, oh, okay. And this is after I'd fished poppers for King Mackerel, and the King Mackerel are, there's more King Mackerel than you can ever catch. They, you know, and they the call most, them kings, and they're Walus and, yeah, you know, whatever. The most exciting fish over there. And, they're, and what happened what, what, what would happen is I would literally take the hooks off my popper and just get the skies. Yeah. So that was really a lot of fun, but we got up into this place and we were fishing this pinnacle and we went through the pinnacle once, quadruple, right? Get these things in, nothing under 50. Sick. All these huge, huge, like there's Make a picture in Accurate of me holding one like this and Dave's beside me and we all have these huge things. And I was sitting there and I was helping, you know, I was basically gaffing the fish and putting them on the deck and then I'd beat the crap out of them and make sure that they're not gonna move anymore. And the other thing is if you do catch Wahoo, it's not a bad idea to have some tape on the deck shut their mouth and tape their mouth closed that works really good it worked for us there but i was sitting there i was getting ready to gaff this fish and i was watching it and the fish was probably 60 70 pounds i saw another one go by and bite it right in half woof right and uh, there was fish 100 pounds probably in the water and i'm not going to say we didn't catch one of those but we had solid 80s but i was looking at this guy and i go how have you fished this spot he goes now nah, once a year so the fish don't know what lures are yeah because that's the part of australia the outback is the scariest because we got caught i told you about that storm we had a a perfect storm on us three ways it was coming in from all directions and we were in that for nine nine hours thought we were gonna die and i was just like oh this is insane the next day was the wahoo day that's sick wow. yeah so, barometer change probably didn't yeah. hurt either wait so let's get back let's let's try to keep ourselves somewhat on track which i know neither of us are good at yeah good <laughs> especially telling fish lies yep. um long range yeah. Okay, you, we were talking about bluefin versus yellowfin. This is always a, a highly contested thing. So me, you know my buddy Clark that I fished down PV with yeah, a ton, yeah. right? We caught a lot of yellowfin, a yeah. lot of good yellowfin. 175 to 250 pound yellowfin. Beasts. The meanest mf -er yeah. on the planet Beasts. that's ever lived. Yeah. All these guys cranking in their bluefin on their jig sticks, 180 yeah. pounder. Like, like, yeah, go, yeah. go ahead and go try yeah, that yeah. With, a, with a big fat yeah. healthy port of Iarda yellowfin you will die yeah. we are not being disrespectful in any way not at giving, all we are giving you our opinions but my opinion runs as deep as his does after catching a lot of those things they are absolutely the most badass animals in the sea that get going like i've spent a lot of time in the northeast i've caught a lot of big ones you know, like you i've been to pei a couple times i've seen the whole thing how can you wind in uh, eight or nine hundred pounder in an hour yeah you're totally fishing, you're fishing 40 feet of water yeah, yeah no 60 so you're, you're 20 feet off sometimes we 60. go deep i've got yeah. a hundred well, yeah a yeah <laughs> that's like so the fish has nowhere to go no no but it's the point the bad. point of the matter is try to try to wind in the elephant like that do you think it has mm. something to do with the gear though because you're you, nope you're fishing stand when you started long range fishing you're fishing stand-up gear yeah no braid backing straight mono and now we wind on i'm talking about i'll take you there tomorrow okay and you can take your same setup you hook a 200 pound 225 pound yellow fin from a boat where i'm going to move the boat to get you on the fish right not dead boating like we would normally you're on that fish for an hour hour and a half there you, you, you have no say in it and when that fish comes to the boat i think we all know bluefin white sea bass and wahoo they just come to the boat flop on their side or like yeah kill me that yellow fin will take you under the boat, into the props, around the thing, around. I mean, it will break your back next to the boat. Yeah. And the bluefin just don't do that. And look, I love catching bluefin. I'm not knocking them at all. But that's a different animal. So when he's talking right now, I have like illusions, like visions of grandeur. I remember sitting on the on the Maximus and I'm on the front and I'm on the starboard side of the boat fighting this fish and when you're fighting a fish no matter what anybody says people will go well you got plenty of drag on that reel most of the time i could never get enough drag so i was holding the spool all the time to regulate and what i remember most and i remember the biggest one that i ever caught i was sitting there and i was stuck he was like 60 feet under the water big fans and people when people don't understand you see the tail you see the sickles you see this giant body 
and it's doing this and i'm like i can't take another crank i take in and jesus who was around the long range scene and that's how i knew him he was on the boat he walked up to me and i i'm not hey i'll tell you exactly you know i've got the rod on the rail i'm not igfa and i'm just trying to get the goddamn thing in he literally ducked down underneath my rod and stood up with my rod on his shoulder he got me three or four cranks and i got the biggest yellowfin i ever got but how many times are you stuck yep on other fish not very many i'll figure it out i'll point the rod straight at him and go like this i'll do whatever it has but this fish i could not move and when i got it i was so elated and i remember taking a picture next to it and it was so big and people were just looking at me they're going well that was a feat i'm like a feat it was like war. It was like going, it was like running through the it's jungles a, with people a, shooting at me. It's a different game. Man. You are so smoked. Yep. When you are done, you are smoked. And yeah, I spent full, I, I had a prototype reel. We won't mention the brand that's very popular these yeah. days. And I was on the bow of uh, the journeyman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. three and a half hours yeah. on a super. Yeah. And dude, I thought I was gonna die. The thing would lose drag pressure every three minutes. I'd oh, have yeah. to go into free spool, hold the spool, ratchet it up, and go again. To that point, I've never there's there's only two fish I fought for longer than an hour and a half in my life. It was that one and that stupid swordfish with Rush. But uh, I, I thought I was gonna die. Yeah. I, I had nothing left, nothing left yeah. in the tank. It was. Uh, it's just it's they got another gear. They got yeah. another gear and they don't get as big, but they definitely pull harder. Yeah. And I think when you talk to guys, you know, another guy who I talk about this with a good bit is Ricky Maxa. Yeah. He's like, I'm like, blue finner, you're like, shh, 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 laugh yeah. at you. Yo, I mean, uh, wait, you're crazy. Now he's, you know, for um, his age, he's done a lot. Ricky's a lot. done a lot of stuff. And I remember uh, when he got his first, he got his first cow, it was like 236 or something. And he caught on an ATD 30 and he called me and he was like, I'm so stoked, man. And I was like, good for you, bro. And then years ago, right? But going to that long range deal, my point is right now versus then. Those guys were like, those guys are heroes, right? To stand up, never put a rod on the rail, 388s, 363s, all these supers that these guys did. I just, I just don't know how they did A lot of those fish came <laughs> I don't know how they did it. I think the, the way that a lot of those fish died, though, because of the tackle back then was they came to the lights at night. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not a long range guy, but I've heard countless stories of those big, big supers and all that stuff in the early long range days were getting killed in eight minutes, 12 minutes. Well, that's when they're confused, you're Correct. right. Come right, and I've seen it a couple of times. You know who got that was, uh, Rollo got a fish that was, you know, 313 or something, and he was on watch. And he went through and checked out through a bait, hooked a fish off the corner, screaming no one's there, gets Frank LaPresti, runs out, comes downstairs and gaffs this fish right in the middle of the night. Yeah. This super in like 10 minutes. What was that dude's name who had the the biggest one? I think for quite a while was Corky Yoko or something. Remember that guy? He had a giant back in the day. I remember reading all about it. Same thing. It was like a 12 minute fight. Yeah. And I, I haven't done that much anchor fishing at night. Like we were generally catching ours at, during the day on yeah. cabbies or skipjacks or whatever. But I remember Lassie <laughs> telling me a similar story. He was down there at the Revy's anchored up and it was 300s as fast as they could get a bait in the water yeah and he said that they were coming right to the lights and they could stick a gaff in them before they even knew it hit them yeah no that i mean for sure and you know that with a 300 pounder you're not putting one gaff in them you're putting four gaffs. yeah yeah as many as you can right so i had lots of times where they'd come in backwards and i i remember handing this fish to this dude and he fought it for like an hour and he couldn't handle it and then i got give me the rod and i fought it for a little bit longer and then all of a sudden got ways and i go now now you wind it <clears throat> he's winding in the fish it's coming in tail first so i'm screaming at the guys don't gaff its tail don't gaff its no. tail and they're like what do you mean i go just don't gaff its tail walk down the rail with this guy get the fish so it comes so it parallels then gaff it in the head and it'll turn around and bounce into the in the hole and he'll stun himself so they're looking at me and what do they do they gaff its tail and when I seen this thing light up, it was like a 350, 360. All the gaffs in the water. After he breaks off, all you could see is gaffs. Like twigs, yeah. It's just bouncing on the water, and people are like, what is that? And I'm like, that is a big mistake. Everybody <laughs> makes that mistake once, and you learn really oh, yeah. quick. I mean, that ass whipping is unparalleled. Oh, when yeah. you've got, And you're the only gaff on it. Oh, my gosh, it's so bad. So bad. Well, yeah, sticking on the top of the long range too, right? One thing that uh, a lot of people won't be able to experience, and I'm sure you have, is Guadalupe. 
Oh, Guadalupe. I experienced Guadalupe in the late 80s. And I saw, I want to say it was Matt Green. I was down there with the guys. And they used to fish a kite with Bonita, huge, what, you, what were you calling them? Bullet tunas, whatever Bullet you want tunas, to call them. Yeah. But they're basically scads. They're fishing scads down there, big scads. And they'd fish the kite, no balloon, had to be wind, at Monster Rock. And I got to see probably one of the last giant bluefin tuna get caught down there. Oh, really? You saw that? Yeah, one? I was on a boat. How I big was, was it? Uh, 285, probably. Uh, so that was that population before yeah. it failed. The one of the vagabond used to go beat the crap out of it. <clears> exactly. Yeah, I exactly. remember that reading about that in Western Outdoor News growing yeah. up. No, it was insane. And, and, the, and the insane part about it, again, the tackle was dirt. Uh, I dude, mean, that is like... So I've only really pulled on one big fish on straight mono. Like, I, I started catching bigger fish in 0304 down in Puerto Vallarta yeah. and we'd already gone to short top shots for the most part. Right. And I remember I was fishing on Martuni. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And with I don't Keith? yeah, I don't know if we had with yeah. with old man Keith, he was awesome. Yeah. I don't know if we had a double or what, but I ended up pulling on one on on like a 50 wide with a bunch of mono on it and I'm like, what is this? Right. There is it's like dude, whoa, uh, whoa, whoa. pulling against a yeah. bungee cord. How the hell those guys landed all those big tuna on bungee cord? blows my mind okay we're morphing a little bit but it's still in the long range deal but what, you listen to what he's saying he's saying lots of monos lots of stretch right yeah. so they fished you know boomer juniors boomers triple x's all this stuff super heavy gnarly stuff the reason they could fish it because of the stretch in the yeah. mono yeah. so as braid came in i remember watching those guys try to fish braid with that stuff I'm telling you 100%, you need a more parabolic rod. You need a rod that's going to put pressure on the fish and not you. And the dynamics of fishing change with just rod building just because of braid. So I was on Let's Talk Hookup <clears throat> this weekend, mm -hmm. and I had the beak with me. I brought him in, drug the old guy. Yeah, in, yeah. And we, we were talking, and I tell people this all the time, and I don't even have to think about it. The single biggest change in fishing in my life is braided oh line. for sure there's yeah. no can you think of anything that changed the sport no 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 i mean you no. guys have built a whole company based on braid. yeah yeah there is no accurate without braid. no you're right you know what i you're mean right. you'd be making the biggest heaviest clunkiest giant but you get that aluminum you shrink that down you put some heavy drag to yeah. it in the right line you can do some stuff so russ eiser was a friend of mine because of milt shed i worked at afco russ eiser was friends with me and with me and greg great he walked up to me and I don't know, it was in 92, 93, whatever it was. He hands me this spool of line. He goes, put this on one of your rods and go try it. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So I didn't know about leaders. I didn't know about anything else, but I fished musky rods for calicos mm -hmm. because I couldn't get a rod that was heavy Oops. enough to pull them. The Fenwick musky rods. Yeah. That's what I had yeah. when I was a kid. It was yeah. a ticket. I actually fished them with the Loomis musky rods is what I was fishing with. And I remember winding down and I fished lock drags because you could not give a big calico any sort of any sort of anything. It's just like a tuna. If he gets his head down, you're done. Yeah. So I remember winding in with that stuff, setting the hook, and as soon as I set the hook, the rod broke. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was like, dude, what just happened? And I went back to Russ and I said, Russ, you know, I respect you greatly, but that stuff's shit. And he goes, No, you don't know how to use it. So I walked away from it for a little bit. Now, was then, that Dacron or it was Spectrum? No, it was, Spe it was Dyneema. Okay. It was Dyneema. So I walked away and I was like, okay, I don't know how to use this, so I'm not going to. Then later someone goes, put a leader on it. And so I started with long top shots. And with the long top shots, you still get that woo, woo, woo. Yep. Then they short got shorter and shorter. It's and 100, shorter. 100 yards, remember? Yeah. When, yeah, when, yeah. when everybody said, oh, you can't, you can't cast braid. You need yeah, to have a yeah. hundred yard top shot of forty yeah. pounds. And, and hey, what do we do now? Oh my gosh! Oh, braid. Oh. You give me a braided reel, I cast that thing in in the moral, yeah. man. It's yeah. crazy. And you will learning. You will blow yeah. that thing up, and you probably have to get some scissors out. But yeah. once your thumb gets trained to it, or spin just, rods, right? No replacement. Yeah. That's what you have on your boat. I've seen you got those spin rods, and those guys can. A guy that can't cast, if he can't cast, hand him that spin rod with specter on it. That's who they're there for, it's man. It's crazy. And, and yeah, you can. It, and the thing with the spin gear is so. I understand it. I accept it. I do use it. Yeah. But when it, fish are bigger than 60 pounds anymore, I'm over it. I'm not doing yeah. it. But people out here don't understand that you can work a stick bait or a popper infinitely better. Oh, way better. And, and anybody better. tells you otherwise is crazy. Yeah. Right. But for me, it's got its place up to a point. And I had a couple last year on the show. You know, we, I was throwing those 5500s and all that. 
and I hooked a couple hundred 20 pounders. Yeah. I'm not going to do that ever again as long as I live. No, that hurts. That. It hurts. Physically yeah. hurts. Like, so anything bigger than that, like we had the foam this year. I'm yeah. just, I'm going to a jig stick or a heavy jig setup, you know? Do you know what they, it, it, the thing about, the thing about those kind of bites too with the foam is everybody's looking at it and they're going, well, you know, it's just this fantastic thing. You know what it's like? It's like standing in a bar, you got your face towards the bar and someone walks up and kicks you right in the nuts right behind you. <laughs> and you're like sitting there and you're like, God, what just happened? Because I was on the Kia Kai and I went through by, by SBI and I was on my way up to Anna Cap and we got into these big foamers and I was looking at him. I was like, man, Charlie, these are big fish. And he goes, let's do it. <laughs> I got bit. I couldn't put enough drag on this thing and it smoked me. <laughs> that's awesome <clears throat> so i mean the whole thing about the, the whole thing about where if you're learning how to fish we've been in a place that was way it was a, a, archaic compared to where it is now and the knots i always talk about people in knots you got to learn your knots you got to learn how to cinch knots you got to and with tying knots in braid to leaders and everything else you have to study your knots because braid does cut floral or mono if you don't tie the right knots and it's a in in long range fishing everybody used to crimp things and if they didn't know how to crimp the fish were gone yeah totally that's we said on our boat all the time tackle failure <clears throat> is not acceptable it's no. just not you'll see me in my ocd i'll cut a knot or a crimp three times in yep. a row if it doesn't feel perfect like it is so hard to get to these fish to get a hook in one of these fish to land one of these fish yeah. You, you got to take care of everything that you can take care of. Well, the way that you, know? you do it, too, is, is, is super important because your fish that you're presenting to, that's the one thing I commend you on is that I fish with you a few times and we fish kites. And the kite things, the kite and the, the yummies, like, eh, it's okay, it's fun, you know, but it's not, doesn't take a, a great amount of skill. It takes skill driving the boat, getting the, getting the bait over here and out of your prop wash. You know, you and I caught a giant one time doing that stuff. It was a lot of fun. But when I got to fish with you in the kite and the balloon and the presentation mode, you have no idea how much I learned. Yeah, I remember you were blown away that first day. Well, you kept don't... on putting it right in, right on him. And I was like, Jesus, look Dude, at this. And I'll tell you, like, that didn't, that was tough. Well, that like was terrible. Fur, the, it was terrible out, just watching it. Figuring yeah. out how to fish a breezer and then figuring out how to fish a breezer in low wind conditions. And, you know, there's guys out there that I'll tell you all day are better at it than we are, but we do it at a high level. And, yeah. like, just being able to spot those fish, being able to position your boat, getting the bait to it. And when there's a lot of wind, everybody's a hero. Oh, yeah. The difference is when there's not a lot of wind and all the stupid little tricks, you know, that we've come up with to get that to work. It's so satisfying. Well, it's, it's boat location, boat location, boat location, right? wind in your back fish down when you're doing whatever you can do to get that thing across and Dwayne, i fish with Dwayne a lot so i watched Dwayne do it i had one epic day with Dwayne where the fish were like off our starboard side with wind on our wind on our backs and we would hook one and get it to someone and he'd go get another one going we'd hook another one get it to someone get another one we had four on at one time and i was sitting there looking at him i was like he's there's a picture around of him going like this I'm sitting right next to him on the rail trying to pull on this thing. And the thing about it was there were so many fish and they were so hungry and they continued to eat. And the preparation, like I always say this, and people sometimes they think I'm crazy, but it's like six P's. Prior, you, you, you look at things and it's um, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. That's pretty if good. If you don't, if you're not prepared, you were talking about knots, right? Yep. So... Tell me if I'm full of shit with this. If you get all your stuff solid to your bait, let's say solid to a jig, all your knots are done, that knot's done, everything on the rod's done, are you going to be able to break that fish off? No, it's impossible. No, see, but that's what people go, oh, I don't know how you got spooled. I'm like, dude, when my shit's right, it ain't busted. You're not. If you're getting spooled, you're doing the wrong thing. You don't have enough drag. You're yeah. using the wrong gear. You Like... I, I, like I said a minute ago, like it is so hard to get a hook in these fish. I mean, yeah. Some days it's easy. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but so hard to get a hook in these fish. Everything between your reel from the butt, the butt of your yeah. rod to that fish's mouth has got to be a hundred percent. Yeah. But what my point to you is, is that some of these reels that I go after these fish, I'm going out from with a 500 yep. gets 20, 24 pounds of drag, 22 pounds of drag. I get it up to 22. I can't lock it. Mm -hmm. Now I got my thumbs in there and I'm thinking I'm going to lose my thumbs or they're going to get everything. And I'm telling you to spool me, you're going to go through a lot. But this year I seen it twice. 
Wow. Where a fish, I couldn't stop the fish, and everybody's going, well, well did you get, you can't lock a reel. There's no way you no, can lock a reel. No, at some point, there's nothing you can do. So you're saying you'd rather get spooled than have your knot bust. Oh, for sure. I don't want oh, my knots yeah. busted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, and sometimes you just get fooled. Like, that's how I ended up hooking a couple of 120s on spin gears there's 30s and 40s jumping around oh, yeah. throw your popper in there splash splash and a freaking volkswagen eats it like yeah. that shit'll happen you got to try to minimize yeah. the impact as much as you can it's it's fun to watch though i have a really good friend and and casey this year was he was sitting in the back of the boat and i was trying to figure these fish out and it was air, air pair air your your boys the guys your flyer not air, air parallel oh, oh yeah our your plan. guy and i was talking to i was talking to jason and jason's like yeah yeah this is down there and so I ran out there and I got down there and I found what he was talking about. And it was a big, big school of fish, but they were all big. Mm -hmm. So he, they're like, what are we doing? I don't have helium. I don't have a kite. I don't have flyers. So, cause I was getting used to doing and go down, throw a popper, you know, yeah. do whatever you're going to catch him. Let's go do something stupid. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he goes, so I'm just going to drop this down. So he drops down this, he drops down his jig and starts whining this jig and he gets bit and i turn around what do i do what do i do i go go to the sunset and he goes what do you mean i go throw the goddamn thing up because you know what you ain't stopping this thing and it literally spooled him and all the fish that i was looking at they were like two 250 bigger yeah that's not casting gear stuff no all. that's just no. house of pain and we call that tuna jail now yeah. you've got these fish all around you, and the one dude's got you in tuna jail. Oh, yeah. You're watching fight pulling this thing for three hours. That's misery. Tuna just, jail? I never heard of that. Oh, That's tuna jail one. is the war. And then, like, when you're on a charter, and you oh, got, like, dude. six guys and 12 eyeballs burning holes yeah. in the back of your neck <laughs> on hour number two, I'm just like, I that, just want to uh, cut that. That goes on a lot right now. It happens a lot. Right a lot. Well, yeah. that, that, especially when I was, like, when I worked on the Prowler, and the, all the bigger fish started popping around, everyone, the biggest outfit they had, had on the boat was 40 pound. Yeah, oh, that ain't going to work. Two or three guys on a boat of 30 people <clears throat> stuck in tuna jail yeah. until the very end, and they're thumb and thumb and thumb and bank, or they just get Well, and I know pulled. Ben will remember this, but when we were younger, you'd be fishing Albacore. And then somebody hook a friggin' 180 pound big guy. Oh yeah, that oh, one. the big wow. guys we don't. Thirty have that five yeah. people watching that one dude pull on that and for the first hour it's like everybody's into it yeah. second hour everybody's like i want to murder this guy yeah and by the third hour people are like trying to throw him overboard yeah and we just don't get that well i mean there has been the albacore the, or the the what do you call it? big eye up north, up north Fort Bragg, yeah. man i would love to go do that gross yeah. got got a couple licks in on those that looks like a blast in my whole life i don't think i, I think i've caught one big eye in my entire life we caught a make-a-wish 2004 yeah. i think we caught four that's what i'm talking about yeah and they were none of, none of them were huge up to about 80 pounds or barry something. caught him barry was catching him yeah. while i was on the boat i remember i came in with a bunch of 60 and 80 <clears> pound big eye. i'm like i got this thing wrapped up some dude yeah. caught like a 185 and yeah. i'm like well there goes that it was crazy those, those fish were real elusive i mean and the funny thing is you can go to madeira and there's there's a tons of big eye over there big ones yeah no it's that's on my list for sure i want a big eye over 200 yeah yeah that that would be something that would be amazing but back to long range fishing just like you know you got to look at it as like the pioneers came to the west and set up you know civilization here it's these guys set up fishing for us and i think there needs to be more kudos back to that there's the thing that i see right now is people don't study the past yeah and if you don't study the past you can't get the information to figure out where we how we got here and by figuring out how we got here then that gives you a different sense of respect for people in fishing period you know? those guys dude i mean all they had like what the old marlin days all those guys yeah. out here like all they had was a vhf oh dude i was they there had for that no yeah. weather they had nothing to to work off of i mean that stuff's just it was just grit man yeah. those guys went out and did it and you didn't know if it was going to be flat calm or you're going to take a beating you really had no, you know, yeah. nothing to gauge it by. And I mean, gosh, the the safety factors back then, Ugh. like going taking those long range boats back <clears> in the <throat> 70s and 80s with shortwave radio and not much backup. And those guys were, like you said, dude, they were on the wagon trains and they were coming out west. And they were going to figure that out. And they yeah, did. And they did. They built they a did. fishery that everybody gets to enjoy today. That's crazy. I think shit still happens today with all the technology we have. Like you guys are going that far south in the 80s and stuff. 70s. Yeah. That's just no, no. so not Even in the 60s and they had to take ice down with them. So they dude, went to, they, you know? they used to go, they used to go to, um, Clipperton, 
And that was a 23-day to, trip to Clipperton in 85. That's crazy. They had nothing. They had they had no weather windows. Where are they going to yeah. figure out the weather? Exactly. The weather's either going to be there or it's not going to be there. And the so thing with Clipperton that everybody says, I, again, never been there, it's either fire or shit and yeah. nothing in between. No, it was helmet most of the time I yeah. heard about it. Yeah, and I, but I've heard stories of hand-feeding 150s right off the back of the boat yeah. as fast as you could. But, man, you talk about a gamble, and that's what those guys were. They were gamblers. They were gambling yeah. with everything back then. No, I truly I truly believe that, that the not only the long-range fleet, but you, you remember the guys that were fishing the local stuff here looked up to the long-range fleet. So they learned a lot from All the that Bruce stuff Barnes, yeah. the Frank Lepresti, the Steve Loomis's, you know, Buzz's. Whoever, I mean, there was a lot, <clears throat> a lot of really good guys trying to figure it out, and yeah. they did figure it out, and they taught, they taught that generation what was going on. So as we go, and, and I think you might agree with this too, but where we're at right now sometimes just gets disheartening for me because I see more people pounding the pounding the keys than spending time on the water, and people always walk up to me and they go, "How did you get where you're at?" Well, my wife probably almost divorced me a couple times because I was never home. My kids never saw me, and I spent 100 plus days every every year all my life fishing, and I still spend 100 plus. But I take my daughters now, I take my wife, I take everybody with me. This year's been phenomenal with the sense of just taking my kids fishing, right? But I also take them on those six day trips, on those 10 day trips. Yeah, yeah. You know. No, and it's like I think there was a lot of opportunity to learn in those days and kind of figure stuff out. I've been lucky enough to be part of a couple of fisheries where we were kind of like PV in the early days, right? We had to figure that out. Long range stuff didn't work. We were fishing no. from smaller boats. Obviously, some of the stuff transferred over, but a lot of it didn't. And I mean, that was like some of the craziest stuff ever. Figuring out the bluefin thing here, you know, trying to get up to speed and catch local wahoo. We yeah. had, had a few opportunities you know, to kind of learn and do new stuff. And for me right now, it's doing the deep drop for rockfish stuff. I'm all, dude, I'm all yeah. in on that. I'm a nerd for I, it. No, I love, I, I, love, I love rock fishing. You With, know, I'd rather go do it. Like, people are like, what about swords? I'm like, they're beautiful. They're fun. But would I rather put my my meat in it or just take a shot, maybe one in 10 trips, I'm going to hook one of yeah. those things. Yeah, no. So I'm, I'm nuts for swordfish too. And that'll, <clears throat> that'll pretty much occupy the next couple of months here. But then as soon as that's over, finding, and I'm talking about like, I'm looking for rockfish in 600 to 1400 feet of water. Ugh. Are you using electric reels? Then? Duh. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm lazy. What are you yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah. There's no way I'm cranking. No, 500 feet. I cranked 500 feet on the cherry bank a while ago and I thought I was going to die. Yeah. We've been doing, <laughs> we've been doing five, even to 600 with the slow pitch jigs. It's yeah. not bad. No, it I did that. I it's did not that. bad. It's fun as hell. Yeah. And the and the wind is not that bad. And there's a there's a breaking point right there at 500 yeah. feet where they just get bigger. They get meaner. Yeah. You know, a lot of cases you get on the right rock. There's just more of them. Yeah, yeah. And this new depth stuff that's opened up this year. I mean, it's a whole new playground yeah. to go. You know, look at some of that stuff. And and I I've been having a blast with it. I'm I'm excited to get back to it. I think tuna season is a grind. You know, you just by the end of tuna season, like yeah. I'm done. I'm okay with it. It's time to put my camouflage on, go yeah, kill yeah. some ducks and catch some cods and do some sword drifts and, yeah, yeah. you know, see how many Modellos I can drink in an afternoon, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Cause man, it is, that's high risk, high reward fishing that we do. And you know, you can strike out any day and it's stressful and it's nice to get back to but something. But that's even, not... think, of, think of it, Ollie, before that was there, there was nothing. Yeah, I know. There was nothing. And people go, well, what do you mean nothing? I'm like, you know, I spent my time Marlin fishing most of the summer. I didn't do anything but catch Marlin and then, Every year, or every year, I'd see a couple of swords. If I got lucky, I'd you know get a bite, and if I got real lucky, I'd catch one. So I was like, you know, that was to me like you like to hunt, and that sword fishing on the surface was like that too. Oh, me. it's so similar. You know, totally. it's like oh, I got one, and yeah. they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, I got him. He's right here, and get the right guy, line up, get a bait in the water, get the bite, fight the fish, and people are like, oh, how's that? You, know, you just catch him? No. You don't just catch them. No, that's a, that is a mean animal. Yeah, the hey. ones on the top are not a nice person. They're not. They don't. They want to really give it to you hard. So well, and a lot of that too is you guys, Marlin guys, you're always using the wrong damn gear. Yeah. No, I always had a I, back then, but again, back then is what we had. I had a Sea Line 80 with 80 pound mono on it. Oh God. I caught my first one, 293.1. On a star drag. On a star drag reel. Negative, Ghost Rider. No, I have no interest. Three in hours and 45 minutes. Thank you, no. Remember the one that we hooked out here? And when Jason and I, that one day, we baited five 
and I had an accurate, I don't remember which model it was. I think it was a Boss 30 on yeah. the roof. And I had a rod that was wrapped just for it. And we finally got our number called and, you know, we were ready. Yeah. And even at that, I fought that thing for an hour and a half. Perfect fish to kill, 150 yeah. pounds, 30 feet behind the boat, pitch dark with in the lights. You could see it. It was yeah. one of the coolest things ever. And it opened its mouth up and went, uh, 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 and that giant circle hook. I watched it fall out of his mouth. You know what? That's a weird thing. I lost one two years ago and I call, I think I called you on it, but it was, it was a big fish on the, on the South nine and it came up. When it came up, it scared the shit out of me. I was the, my daughter was going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And I just turned around and said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going to happen right now, but it's going down. And the fish came by. We fought it for like 20 minutes. It jumped up again, and that circle hooked through. So it was like. Dude, I don't understand how it could be in there for an hour and a half. Yeah. Pulling on it as hard as I wanted. That thing did so many flybys off the back of the boat. Oh, yeah. If we'd have had a harpoon, it would have already been dead. Oh, yeah. You know, and. Uh, That's what I'll never understand why we can't use harpoons. I, because they don't want people poking holes. I, I get the basis of it, but they, I don't think they realize, like, you can't lay down on the front of your parker and harpoon a swordfish. He's not yeah. going to let you get near him. So for safety's sake, and this is something I've talked about with CCA, with all these guys out here messing with swords. I agree. Dude, let them harpoon them. I Why agree. not? And you can harpoon a tuna. Yeah. It's perfectly legal. You can harpoon it. Har you can. It says specifically in the regs, you cannot have a harpoon on board when you're fishing for sharks or swordfish. Otherwise, you can have a harpoon. Here, you can harpoon all the bluefin you hey, want. Hey, you guys. I didn't even know that. I learned my something again today. <laughs> yeah, there's your, yeah, no, guess what? Thing. Come on. We're going tuna fishing. <laughs> and a lot of times when I, the, uh, one of the areas or a couple of areas I like to fish swords are in Mexico. I got yeah. a harpoon. I'm taking it. I'm not taking that chance. And swordfish is the only fish, except for maybe a mako, after you hook him, he comes right by the boat on purpose and to look at how he's going to kill you. No, and you know what? I had, I've caught a few of them on the surface that I had one charge this boat, and I had a guy in the boat, like I was by myself. This guy came in, got on the boat with me, and he goes, what do you want to do? And he was uh, with Mike Halsey, and I said, just kill it yeah exactly and it was running at the boat and i had a had a gaff here it was gonna ram the boat yeah. and he stuck it right in the head and i dropped the rod and reel and stuck it again and he goes now what i go throw it in the boat and it was like 100 it was weighed 116 and he, he threw it in the boat and we beat the snot out of it and it, it was all good but just the thought of me going what are we going to do now put it in the boat i don't i don't think i'd ever do that again no the first one i caught locally deep drop <clears throat> came right to the boat yeah. I mean, from bite to tight to on a gaff, that thing was 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It barely even fought coming up. I think we just caught it off guard, and I got it on the leader. I was fighting it with the electrical. I, le I wired it, and I'm wiring it, and it's going around, and my buddy looks up, and we thought it was an OPA. Yeah. Because it, it came so easy, and it was that super green water. Yeah. And it comes up, and the electric reel stops, and I look over the side. We're expecting an OPA or a thresher or something. Yeah. I go, yeah. Just like that, that call. <laughs> my boy's like, what? I'm, you know, yeah. running around. We had gas out. He gets gas. So I start to wire it because I, I didn't have the weight off. We right. were like a 30-foot leader, totally cooped out. Don't yeah, know yeah. what we're doing. I start start wiring it, wiring it. I'm taking my wraps, and it's just spinning around. I look at my boy. I'm like, I don't know. Stick it. Yeah. And he puts one in the head. And I'm like, well, that went really smooth. Yeah. And then I hit him with another one. And I, he's like, they uh, wake up. now what do we do? Yeah. And it's just laying there on the gas looking at us. I'm like, oh, I got just the solution for yeah. this. This tells you how stupid I am. I go into my backpack. Pull out a nine millimeter. I, oh, <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say a knife. And I was no, gonna a knife would have been smart. Maybe yeah. this was not smart. I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. It's purple as hell. You can tell it's going to blow up any yeah. second now. I shoot this thing in the forehead. Lasley had told me stories of shooting swordfish in the forehead. Yeah. Their head just explodes. Yeah. His eyes came flying out. He took off, got off yeah. the gas. We had him hooked in the in the tongue really, yeah. really good. Or that fish would have just spun out of sight. Got him to the boat, put him back together, <laughs> took some people. No, but you know what you're pictures. saying? There's a video out, and Lasley knows the video, where they pull up and they don't they don't use nine millimeters. They use shotguns. That, with slugs. that was I we I cut that video and we yeah. put it on BD. They slug this thing yeah. and it blow its head off and it's still does, and it going doesn't bananas. even blow its head off. It vaporizes it. Oh, it's yeah. gone. People don't realize like for as bad as that bill is, their head, you could literally jam your finger through the top oh, yeah. of their head. It's super, super soft. Really? Yeah, so when you hit them with a gun or whatever, it doesn't put a you hole in them. You know what video it I'm just, talking just, about, right? Uh, right on the rail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. it for last It, it, it was her. like, you're looking at it and you're going, oh my God, And he did like, because remember it was like a super good day, so they were running around throwing gear and fish as fast as they yeah. could, and then they were picking up the fish. They were, they were popping up so quick, they were just sticking them and throwing the gear overboard. So they were just driving up to the gear, bang, blow their head off, put them in the boat, next yeah. one, bang. I mean, they went, they killed five fish 
picked up and killed five fish in, I don't know, half an hour or something. Yeah. And it was gnarly. But, yeah, so the, the lesson here is don't shoot swordfish in the head. Yeah, the lesson here is know what you're doing and make sure that you've got some sort of plan. Yeah, You don't gaff. go in there, you know, by the seat of your pants with those things for sure. No, I know and they had they're, the opportunity to catch swordfish in Florida. <clears throat> Have either of you had the opportunity to, like, target swordfish in another country or in a, in a different uh, I've just done I've just done Florida in here. Yeah, same with me. Florida in here. Um that's that's really high on the list. Like I got a client who I fish who's got a, a bitchin boat that we helped build him down in Cabo and he wants to go do deep drops there. And I know. I mean like yeah. there's no there's no if, there's no about, no nothing. We'll get down there, we'll find that scatter layer and we'll drop wow. baits off the side and it'll be on. I was I've had days in Florida literally where I caught four of them. Yeah. You know, and they're like, hey, what's up? You know, and uh, I catch a couple on like winding ATDs and then I catch a couple on the lingering pitmans. Lingering pitmans pretty fun. That's an amazing piece yeah. of machinery. It is really Same with the hookers. It's incredible the amount yeah. of power that they have. Dude, we were in the Bahamas trolling for Wahoo on the LPs uh, earlier this year and we hooked like a 350 blue. Yeah. Smoked it. Really? I mean, that fish never jumped. Well, those are badass fish, period. Uh, no, I'm saying the real smoke, the blue, oh. just whipped his But those blue ass. marlin are freaking That's a different gnarly. animal. Guys don't understand. Guys, nothing takes line off of a reel faster than a blue marlin or a big dog tooth. That's the only thing that I've yeah. ever seen compare. So we, we were fishing in Australia. Like, it was probably the early 90s we were fishing in Australia, and I had Wayne Bisbee with me on that trip. And I remember hooking this fish, and, and I was going, get in the chair, get in the chair, and we're, everything's going on, and we're sitting there, and there's no jump. But this is a 130, and this 130's getting smoked, right? Like Wahoo smoked. Like smoked. Yeah. And, and I was fishing with Chris and, and he on the Jan Lee, and Chris Jones goes, it's a doggy, mate, it's a doggy. And I was like, doggy? And I'd never had any sort of... When I saw that thing come in and I saw how big the dentures were on oh, that yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, it's a different animal. But that thing smoked that reel to a certain point, and it was done. Where a black marlin's going to smoke a little bit. He's going to jump a little bit. You're going to get a little bit. He's going to go. The black marlin thing would go back and forth. But they on the reef, they have tons of those things. Oh, there's so many there. And yeah. huge ones. The problem is getting one to the boat without with the sharks. Well, the sharks get know? everything. Yeah. They do. Yeah, it's tough. When we did that Coral Sea trip, we hooked a few. And you're right. They're, they're, they are an 800-pound wahoo. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what they pull. Crazy. When they hit the lure, I don't care how long you've been fishing, it will scare the yeah. shit out of you. Like, you will jump out of your chair. It's so violent and so loud. Yeah. And we were fishing them on 80s, I think. And we have like 55 at strike, right? 80s thing, would be interesting, too, on it's those screaming, things. It's screaming. Like a yeah. Wahoo on a casting reel. And at 55, and then we'd go over the button, 65 pounds, and the fish would accelerate. Yeah. It's not even possible. Not yeah. A blue marlin can't do that. A, a big big eye or a big blue fin can't. No fish can pull. Obviously, it's a sprinter. You know, yeah. It's not a marathon runner, but that dog dog tooth is something else. Yeah. No, to me, if a fish that fight in the water, or that, that are great fighters, it'd be a doggy, a giant trevally, you know, yellowfin tunas. I'm talking about for their size. Like, yeah. I've caught trevallies up to, like, 100 pounds on a spin rod. Stupidest thing I've ever done. Almost died. Yeah. Again, and I was fishing Komodo Island with some guys and watched the blow up, and the guy goes, that's a big one. And I'm like, oh, my God. What was a big one there? 120-pounder. That's huge. Yeah, I hooked one that size yeah. in the shallows, and we chased it for like 10 minutes. Yeah. For, this you, isn't you shallows. This is like on deeper. The edge of the reef. Yeah. Oh. So you don't, yeah, you don't have as much to worry about. No. Yeah, no. this was like we, – we hooked some stuff there. This is talking about Australia. I did that trip with the Nomad guys about seven or eight years ago. I mean, Napoleon Rass. Yeah. Those I, had are one, bitchy. I had one come up. It was just a black spot. Yeah. I don't, it was at 100 something. And it was like, up, ate the popper, you're broke off. Yeah. <laughs> that fat. <sighs> but that's, that's that fishing. And I guess the one thing we could say to all you guys is that go out and experience fishing. Don't get stuck in one spot. Go yeah. out and try to find it. Like, these guys think I'm crazy, but this right now is the month for me. I go brown trout fishing for the big browns I don't mess with. I'm not fishing power bait. I'm fishing big, big, like, lures, jigs, whatever else. But then the next thing is pyramid. And catching a solid 15, 20-pound fish on six-pound test, that is a feat. Yeah, and that's the mark of a real fisherman, not just stuck to one thing. Yeah, do everything. Like, I know you love to trout fish. You know, that's how I grew up yeah. fishing. I couldn't afford to ocean fish, man. We, yeah. we trout fished every summer 
Um, I, I love it. I'm sick with it. It's yeah. nice to get off the boat, get away from the fuel, the motors, the noise, and just, you know, kick yeah. back and, and make some casts and probably have a couple IPAs yeah. in my creel soaking yeah. in the river. And, man, to me, that's just – that's a lot of fun. Yeah. No, and I, I think diversity of fishing with – people go, well, you do everything. And I go, I do. But, you know, the only thing that changes – is the size of the tackle. Yeah, totally. Everything else is the same. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, structure, line, you know, water temp. You, you know, you're looking at moon phases, bait. There's not a whole bunch of stuff. The factors changes. are always the same. There yeah. are in currents in lakes. And, you know, in the, in the moon, it, it affects the same thing with the fish. I remember being in a largemouth bass fishing, and we used to follow Bill Murphy. And Bill Murphy had a book called The King of San Vicente. Yeah, yeah he, they, he had a book out, and I read that book religiously, and I got to know the moon phases. And, you know, when Casitas was in its heyday, I fished it. So I had caught a lot of really big fish with stoats, and we learned it. But that kind of fishing taught me how to do the same thing with saltwater. I just had to sit and listen and learn. Yeah, was that, it was, I think it was Hunt for Giant Bass. <clears throat> I yeah. read that book. No, was it wasn't Hunt. It's Pursuit of Giant. Is that what it was? Yeah. Pursuit of Giant Bass. Yeah. yeah. And do the craziest thing that that guy did that in that day nobody could understand. That's why he always won. Was he bottom fished in the middle of the lake? Yeah. For bass. Yeah. Like you don't think about that. He would straight up yeah. fish a Carolina or a dropper in the middle of the lake and catch giants when yeah. they weren't up in the shallows and he crushed it. You know, you know what he did that my dad was a big fisherman. So that's where my, all my stuff comes from. But there was a guy named Buck Perry and Buck Perry is the first one that figured out structure fishing by fishing in the middle of the lake and the sides of the lake. But he would get lures that would go deep enough. And he'd chart his lakes by what the lures bounced off of. Oh, that's crazy. Buck Perry Structure Fishing is like the structure book that most fishermen that ever got into it. I never read, read that one. No. Yeah, just look it up. It's it's crazy. But as you get, like, coming from that way and coming to where we are now, I'm telling you, Ollie, even in your time, you've come so far. And you, you stop and you turn around and you're like, oh, my God. You know, it's like. We've learned so much. And those lessons apply everywhere you fish. And like, yeah, it's funny because you and I fish in a bunch of different places and I, you aren't, you aren't there to fish. You just, you're no. there to listen. And like a lot of guys, I'll get guys that have been there, done that on the boat. They'll yeah. tell me how we do our stuff and all that. You're just watching. Yeah. And that's good. I mean, I think if you're not learning, you know, you're not trying hard enough and, and you even more than me, you've got to fish with a lot of guys you have no business fishing with and yeah. learn from them Yeah, all over the world. Everywhere I go, somebody knows you they may not like you like but no. yeah no, I mean, no. everybody knows benny and i people ask do you know ben seacrest i'm like oh got it yeah, yeah. I, I know that guy i know that guy it's funny and it's and, and you leave a good impression in your wake which is important yeah. i know to you and it's the same with me like i want people to you know to, to like yeah that guy paid attention yeah he was a good fisherman yeah he was you know whatever like that stuff's important to me and getting respect from those yeah. guys all over the world i think it comes with being a student of the game yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great way to put it, a student of the game. Oh, dude, if you want to be good at this and you want to be doing this for a long time, you got to be a student of the game. And there's, you know, with this bluefin cycle we have here now, there's a lot of one-dimensional fishermen. Oh, yeah? A lot of them. You know, they learned that. They got all excited. They caught some bluefin. But it's like, all right, what do you know about sand bass? See, what he just said is like a huge thing because once that goes away, guess what? Right. A lot of boats for sale. Yep. A lot of people hurting. And I'm not being – that's why my diversity of fishing – if he calls me tomorrow and says, hey, let's go largemouth bass fishing over at Ote. Gone. I'm going. Let's I'll go. do whatever you want to do because you know what? To be able to do a variety of things, like going to New Zealand, right? We get to New Zealand and people are like, what do you really want to do? Well, I know I'm going to go catch kingies at White Island, right? So I know that's going to happen. I want to go catch giant. I want to go catch some giant browns. And, I want to... and they look at me and they go, trout? I'm like, yeah, boom, go do it. Go catch the kingies, see a sword that gets caught over on the Bay of Plenty and catch a couple tunas. It's all about diversity. And you know what it's more so about? It's about the memories that you create. And it's not only for you, but the people that are with you. Like you just said. Oh, totally. That's what I like about guiding and, and taking industry friends and all that. I want to get you your first or your biggest because you'll never forget either one. Oh, no. I still I remember either most one. of all me and you on that one that one day we we're out. And I'm running the deck, and you're driving the boat, and you go, <clears throat> you go, you got everything set? And I go, yeah, I think I got everything set, you know? And you get the you get the bird way over on the side, and I'll never forget, you said, 
because to me, if you're marking fish and they're 300 down, you ain't going to get those fish on the, on the, on the yummy. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, oh yeah, shit, I'm marking some. Oh yeah, I got some here. At, and he says like 100 feet, and I turn around, and the kite goes, boom, goes straight down. I'm like, oh, we're bit. And you go, Rawr. Dude, and at that point, there wasn't many over 200 caught. No, that was damn near 300. Yeah, it was we 289, I think. Yeah. I mean, we had the state record for a good two months before yeah. somebody broke it. <laughs> But I mean, that was that was one of the dude. I'll, we forget that bite ever, never. No, never. you know why? Because everything was perfect. You did, you perfected your your move. <coughs> Excuse me, where the bait had to be, speed, everything else. When that happened, it but, looked like a dinosaur. But there was people sleeping. It was me on the broad, and I was like, "Hey, is someone gonna get up?" That that was dude. That was a one for the record. You guys, that picture I got you guys up on the bow. Yeah. And I'm spinning the bow around this fish, trying to get it right. We killed that thing fast. Yeah, I remember, and you stuck the first gaff in, and I think I flew off the flying bridge. Oh no, yeah, and it was nuts. Two more. That was dude, that was just one of those days, and then. Do you remember putting in the boat in the back? Yeah, it slid in, and I looked at it. I'm like, oh my oh, god, shit. it's damn near super. Else. Yeah, yeah, this is something else. And then, the, for me, like growing up, all those legendary pictures you would see of the guys hanging a fish at the Marlin oh, yeah? Club. We did it. There was not. There's just no better way to end that chapter. No, that was really right? good. And that it was. was fun. We didn't know if that that was going to last one season. Or 10 and here we are it's not as significant as it was but in that day boy that yeah. was something those pictures we got of it hanging off yeah. the back of the boat i mean that's just those are cool times so some of the stuff i want to talk about like i said earlier that i'm really jealous that you got to do a lot of it's longevity and having a lot of friends around the world but it is the travel fishing yeah yeah so i haven't I, i've been i've been very fortunate to go to a lot of places but you got me five to one. You fished everywhere. Yeah, you know what? And, and the hardest thing, I'm not going to say the hardest thing is the best thing I had. I met those people at shows. They yep. invited me, yep. and I went. So because I had worked at AFCO, I got this opening. And then I worked at Shimano, and I had an opening. So you meet the people. They know your core. They're going to invite you. So, like, one of the craziest trips I ever did was um, Cat's Meow with um, John Sabonis. But Cat's Meow is a 37 Merit, and they're fishing the Boy Scout tournament, so they invited me down. And Carl Anderson, you know who Carl Anderson was? He was, Carl? De he was the deckhand. Oh, geez, you're going and, back. Yeah, way, way back. Well, where and, was this out of? Somewhere in Florida? No, well, no, he was up in New Jersey, and the boat was in New Jersey. So okay. they took the boat down, and we got down there, and I showed up. Where were you fishing out of? St. Thomas. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. so, yeah. So we were down there doing that, and I remember getting on the boat, and one of the guys goes, you can, and I caught, I'd never caught uh, like a proper blue marlin, in it, or, and this was like, I don't know, this is like I said, maybe 92, 91, no, this was 91, 92, yeah. So we get down there, catch catch one, guess what I had with me? All the stand-up gear from long range fishing. <laughs> so they looked at me and they go, what are you gonna do? And I go, I'm gonna catch one stand-up. And I was sitting there watching it, and, and he goes, well, what do you want to do? And I go, I want to do a bait and switch, because I had fished with Ken and Nakamura over in Hawaii, so I knew about bait and switch. So we set up a bait and switch. We got that thing rolling. Blue Marlin came up on a teaser. I got the bait and switch in, hooked the fish, had all my stand-up gear on. Boom. Went to work, caught a three. I think we killed, we killed it. It was 380 on stand-up. Put it in the boat, and Carl Anderson walked up to me and goes, you're the first one to catch a blue marlin on stand-up in St. Thomas. That's awesome. And I looked at him and I go, wow. And they had held all this video. I had fish pen reels. I was in the pen video that later that year. And it was such a weird thing because they told me as long as the fish stay stuck, you can catch as many as you want. So then I seen this other one coming up and I was like, oh, I'm not going to do the bait and switch with this one. It's too big. So he piles on something. I ended up catching a, a 600 plus pound Blue Marlin that we let go the first trip to St. Thomas. I caught four that day. That's it was sick. insane. And I go That's home sick. and people are asking me how was the trip. I go, it was okay. And then Carl would tell him, why are you, why are you saying it was okay? I'm like, I'm not going to say nothing more. I mean, I caught what I wanted to catch. And then, you know, you had got those, you have trips like there's some places that you go that are, you've been to Guatemala. Guatemala is sort of interesting. Yep. You know, you get down there, you're doing the deal and you're like, eh, I don't know. And, it's just hairball, but the fishing is amazing. 
Yeah, Guatemala is actually with uh, the Casa Vieja program, super, super easy. Yeah. You know, and I'm going down there in a couple of weeks, and dude, I'm fired. I don't care about catching selfish. Yeah. I just like the whole experience. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. And for a first timer or whatever, you really can't beat if you, it. If you've never seen active volcanoes, active volcanoes yeah. it's it is an adventure they've got legendary boats i mean you're gonna see more billfish the only place that compares and is not year round is mag bay of course yeah, yeah but you know on a slow day you're gonna raise 15 on a good day you're gonna raise 60 billfish and there's gonna be a blue or two mixed in and yeah. some giant mahis which i can't get enough of and you got opportunities to catch tuna like dude last year yeah. they're catching 250 pound tuna down there See, I, when I was there, it was just straight blue marlin and sailfish. It, it's the fisheries changed. I think it's that same stuff that's happening in Costa Rica, hmm. where Costa Rica was sailfish and dorado as long as we were growing up, and now it's a legit tuna fishery, which gets yeah. me a lot more excited. See, and, again, I fish out of the Los Sueños, and I fish out of a few places in Costa Rica, and, and it was always billfish, 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 yep. doggy. You know, when I say doggy, dog tooth, pargos. dog tooth pargos, and that kind of stuff is what you're after. Lots of roosters. That's you know. changed <clears throat> with conservation, you know, being yeah. making making things better. But um, that's funny with the stand up gear because we went to PEI the first year. Oh yeah, I know. Guys, yeah, you remember know. they're like, no, you're never gonna. That's you, you did it. You, oh yeah, we did. Yeah. We just like went right to work, just like we were fishing in Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. You know, the early days of Puerto Vallarta was all harvest fishing for us because we were fishing out of yachts yeah. and shoot, I had my twenty five foot Grady down there catching big black marlin and. And it was like, uh, it, we only knew stand-up. And yeah, that yeah. Was, a lot of that was what, what, you know, you guys had kind of pioneered on the long-range boats yeah. transferring over. And, and still, if I'm catching a, a fish on the back of a Cabo, I probably want that guy in a harness. Yeah. You know, Casey came out and did it with us on the blue fin. He wanted to fight one out of the harness and all that. Yeah. I'm like, you need to do that again? He's like, no, I'm good. I just can say I did Yeah, it. yeah, like, yeah. Trying to get around the boat now that we're so used to the rail Well, he sells them. He better do it. Yeah, right? and he, he, did, he kicked that fish's ass. But it was, it, you know, it was a nice, mean 220-pounder or something. Yeah. And uh, it, it has its place for sure. But I think, at least for us, the rail rod has changed everything. And, and it's funny because the Florida guys think it's cheating or it's easier. Yeah. It's way easier to catch a fish in a harness. And way, way, way easier to catch a fish in a chair. Yeah. You want to know a fun fact? I've never caught a single fish out of a chair in my life. Uh, Not yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, unless I was sitting around, you know, trout fishing and, in a chair. And, and you know what? <laughs> the hardest thing for you, you get in a chair like I was, and you're almost in a different territory. Oh, it's you a different You don't know what world. you're doing. Yeah, it's a so different So you're trying world. to push and do all this stuff, and then you got a bucket harness, and you're trying to do all this stuff. And at the end, I'm like, why did I just do that? Yeah, totally. And that's always will, will be my gripe with, you know, the trout wise or the head of the IGFA <clears> is a good buddy of ours. And we give each other crap all the time. But it's like, how can you have a 65 year old, 350 pound man land a 750 pound marlin in a chair, barely break a sweat? And you're going to tell me that catching a yellow fin that weighs 300 pounds with nothing but my bare hands and the edge of the boat is not real fishing? Oh, that's real fishy. Oh, my God. The first time I caught a big one on the rail, I'm like, this sucks. Give me my harness yeah. back. And people don't understand, if you haven't done it, when you can cut off all the feeling to your left arm because you're pulling so hard and you're holding on at the same time, it's amazing. And then what you do learn is you learn how to rebound. And people are like, what does that mean? And I go, you have to keep the rod bent. So you only have – that's the whole thing I talk about these rods – in the old days, we had rods like this, and they didn't bend. So if you gave the fish anything, it came up, he'd spit, he's gone. So now what you do is you have the safety net of this rod that's got some parabolic bend to it. And what happens is it gives you the opportunity to keep the fish on the entire time. And that's why I'm sitting there when people get tired and I'm watching, I'm like, don't let that rod come unbent. And they're like, dude, you're so adamant. I'm like, do you know any fish I watch swim away because people do that? No, it's, and I tell people that, like new people, when they're fighting one, you know, we're using those bitchin' wrap system pipes now, you know, yeah. where you can stand up and really yeah. fight them, even on the front of, of a taller boat like mine, and just watch the rod tip. That's wrap all you got to do. pipes. You know, all he came to me to build do. those. Oh, really? And he goes, what do I name them? I go, why don't you name them wrap? Really? Yeah, ask him. Ask him about it. And he goes, yeah, I could just come out with some synonyms that come in right with that. Is a rail assist pipe yep. or something like that? Yeah, okay, okay. It's I, pretty funny. That guy's a cool guy. He's super nice. Joe? Guy. Oh, yeah, as yeah. nice as they come. Hey, dude, Joe, just, you killed it, man. You made it. He's so <laughs> – and, dude, it's a yacht quality. You know yeah. I like my stuff a little fancy. Yeah. I, keep, I keep my stuff clean. We're not running – and it, it is – you can put that right on the rail of a Viking, yeah. and it looks like it fits in. It's a I, really I nice I literally bar. like – and you do the same thing. I go from one boat to the other. So people go, do you have – I'm like, don't worry about it. So I come up, and I sure got 50s, and – 
I got all the stuff. I got the stuff to cast poppers, whatever. I got the kite. I got up. So I show up and they're going like, "You're a one, you're a one snap deal." And I go, "Yeah, I got the bags. I got everything." But if you're not prepared, oh, where yeah, do you go? And that wrap goes with me everywhere. Now. now I do. I keep one of them in my bag. If I'm gonna go guide on someone yeah. else's boat, that's it's standard equipment. It just makes it so much easier, and especially for shorter people or whatever. You know, yeah, not yeah. as strong. If you learn how to use that right, you can really take a lot of pressure. So I'm going to put out, and someone, probably they'll figure out who this is for, but you don't use a wrap for a Tranks reel, right? You don't use it for a baitcaster bra. That thing is for a big reel, right? We've been using them for both. Right. We had this little snap, What is it? it's probably been a month ago now. We're kind of around Catalina in the 277 there. We were catching good fish, 80 to 120, 80 to 140, but it was all foamer fishing. Yeah, yeah. So that's like the ultimate, right? Once I get over a hundred something, you can't throw your jig stick anymore. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you're not on kite gear. You kind of got to get something in the middle. And I was actually, I was using that eight foot pen, like a wahoo. Oh, that's bomb why rod. they're using it. They're using it because of the eight foot rods. Yeah. A eight foot rod with like a pen wahoo bomb and yeah. then a fathom 25. And you know, you read the specs on all those little reels, like your accurates and how yeah. much drag they make and all that. You're never going to test that mm -hmm. until then. I mean, we would have those things hammered down yeah. like in the old days you'd be hitting it with pliers hammered down. Yeah, yeah 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 and dude it'll stop them it'll really stop them yeah. again braid small reels big fish i mean Woo! that's as fun yeah. as it gets you know <laughs> that's as fun as it gets yeah no i've been i very very fortunate to meet the right people in my life thanks dad for getting me my start thanks ali for being my friend and hey. teaching me some stuff dude thank you but for uh, I, I think the whole thing with life is just lived one day at a time my motto right now is like fishing through life, life through fishing. And people go, why do you say that? Chris O'Rourke was a surfer, said surfing through life, life through surfing. Chris O'Rourke died of cancer. Oh, wow. So uh, that's for him going forward. And he was from down here. But it's just like, get out, enjoy it. Take your kids fishing, right? And take advantage of those offers you get. You know, if you're lucky yeah. enough to get invited somewhere. And dude, for me right now, like I turned 50 this year. Oh. Yeah, uh, I, 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 well, I was a lot younger than that when we started yeah, hanging out, yeah. and it's being able to extend my career to be able to do the stuff I like, yeah. which is fishing and bow hunting, for as long as yeah. I can. Because, dude, you, when you're 65, you are not in the tower of a CV taking a royal beating running no, around. No, you can't right? do it. You, and then, uh, what you said we were talking about earlier, we all gain weight, we all get out of shape. It's getting that back. You have to. You have to understand you have to be in shape to do what we do totally and i mean yeah you and i like uh like our tacos yeah, yeah. and our beers but dude when it comes time to go chase a, an elk up a mountain or pull yeah. on a big fish like i i work out yeah just so that i can still do that stuff yeah. and you don't lose it, i i get by on technique <laughs> yeah. and everybody's like <laughs> well, how did you do that it's it's technique but you know i do take a major beating yeah well you still surf i mean you're yeah you're... i try i try to stay in shape but remember i had my back done and i had my shoulders done and hey part of getting it's, old it's just yeah. all part of getting old and yeah. enjoy your life right dude and you're especially in the business that we're in and, and yeah. the opportunities we're given uh people what do you do i'm like i'm the luckiest guy alive yeah we are you're the luckiest guy like yeah. dude the stuff that you've been able to do and been able to see and and make a living doing it like that's why i really enjoy coming on here and sharing yeah. being an open book teaching young guys yeah you know like anymore somebody cuts me off or runs over my breezer i don't <clears> scream <throat> at them i go over and try to educate them with maybe some choice words. Well, no, I, I, I know that one of your, one of our other friends was on here and he was talking about getting cut off on the kites and I was cracking up because <laughs> you know what? It's not just him, but if you cut the wrong person off with the kite, show people respect, stay away from people, let them do what they're doing yep. and, and, and find your own fish, bro. I know, man. It's, is just life's too, life's too good to, to stress over that kind of stuff. Yep. And I'm trying to get better at it. I used to be a hothead too. Yeah. I want to go murder somebody and yeah. all that. But no, man, enjoy the days on the water. You don't know when's going to be your last one. And now exactly. we're getting a little older and we got some friends that are starting to disappear. Like it, take everything. Yeah, that Pete Wright just died, you. man. That was, that was a, know, that yeah, was a guy that came in. Way yeah. Back, way back and a pioneer. It's yeah. like none of this stuff is, it should be taken for granted. Just enjoy what it gives you yeah. every day you're on the water. Yeah, man. Well, we're running out of time here, but this has been really, really cool to hear you guys shoot the shit and kind of reminisce and tell stories. I think it's going to be really cool for some people to kind of see you guys in your uh, 
normal state rather than a trade show state or something yeah like no that. no appreciate no, it that's so, fun uh, man it's, i'm glad you came down yeah yeah, yeah. it's good to catch up i know with our schedules during the season it's always hard seems like we yeah. find a window or two every year but let's, let's run this back in a couple of weeks do another episode maybe later in the afternoon so we can drink some beers <laughs> yeah you know what i think a really good episode too would be is just um one on reagan too ollie because there's so many people that are lost yeah i agree and that's one of the things i get the most feedback on is those youtube videos that we yeah. do i love doing that yeah. I love it, man. Well, I know you do. I'm on the boat with you, and you're doing it. Get, it's pretty fun. Get a guy up to speed, you know, and help him out and, and share. If you've got a little bit of knowledge, you know, you've always been a guy who's an open book and is teaching guys. You know, I, I'd encourage everybody to do that. Yeah. But thanks for coming down, Ben. Yeah, I appreciate thanks, it. Yeah, thanks awesome. for battling Thank traffic. And, yeah, let's go fish. You. <laughs>